Hello everyone, I am Nupur and welcome to my YouTube channel that is Impact for Learning with Nupur. Students, today I am going to give you the brief explanation of the chapter Lost Spring from Flamingo Book which is a part of CBSC Grade 12 Literature section. The writer of the story is Anis Jung who is a famous writer and has been an editor and columnist for major newspapers in India and abroad. The story Lost Spring is taken from her book titled Lost Spring Stories of Stolen Childhood in which she analyzes how poverty-stricken life exploits the life of children. Okay, now para one, let's get started. Why do you do this? I ask Saheb, whom I encounter every morning scrounging for gold in the garbage dumps of my neighborhood. Saheb left his home long ago. Set amidst the green fields of Dhaka, his home is not even a distant memory. There were many storms that swept away their fields and homes, his mother tells him. That's why they left, looking for gold in the big city where he now lives. I have nothing else to do, he mutters, looking away. Go to school, I say glibly, realizing immediately how hollow the advice must sound. There is no school in my neighborhood. When they build one, I will go. If I start a school, will you come? I ask, half joking. Yes, he says, smiling broadly. A few days later, I see him running up to me. Is your school ready? It takes longer to build a school. I say, embarrassed at having made a promise that was not meant. But promises like mine abound in every corner of his bleak world. So, in Para 1, the author of the story encounters a boy named Saheb every day, who is always busy in finding gold in the garbage dumps of, her, of his neighborhood. Saheb has left his home with his family, which was located between the green fields of Dhaka, but many storms had taken away their homes and that is their reason of finding gold in the garbage dumps of big city. The author promises the little boy that he wants to start a school where the boys like him can get education and the little boy willingly says yes to this opportunity. After a few days when the boy asks the author about his promise that is to start a school, then the author feels ashamed of making a false promise. Okay. Now, para 2. After months of knowing him, I ask him his name. Sahibe Alam, he announces. He does not know what it means. If he knew its meaning, Lord of the Universe, he would have a hard time believing it. Unaware of what his name represents, he roams the streets with his friends, an army of barefoot boys who appear like the morning birds and disappear at noon. Over the months, I have come to recognize each of them. So in Para 2, after knowing the boy, the author comes to know his name, that is Sahib -e Alam, which means Lord of the Universe, which is not easy for the boy to believe it. He roams the streets with his friends and usually seen near the garbage areas. And after a definite period of time, the author is able to recognize each of his friends. Right? Now Para 3. Why aren't you wearing chappals? I ask one. My mother did not bring them down from the shelf, he answers simply. Even if she did, he will throw them off, adds another who is wearing shoes that do not match. When I comment on it, he shuffles his feet and says nothing. I want shoes, says a third boy who has never owned a pair all his life. Travelling across the country, I have seen children walking barefoot in cities on village roads, it is not lack of money, but a tradition to stay barefoot, is one explanation. I wonder if this is only an excuse to explain away a perpetual state of poverty. So, in Para 3, when author asks one of the boys for, for the reason of walking barefoot, then the boy simply blames his mother for not providing him the shoes. The author knows the reason of these boys of walking barefoot as it is not lack of money but a tradition to stay barefoot because they want to gain sympathy of others by showing their poor condition. Fine, now para 4. I remember a story a man from UDP once told me. As a young boy, he would go to school past an old temple 
where his father was a priest. He would stop briefly at the temple and pray for a pair of shoes. Thirty years later, I visited his town and the temple, which was now droned in an air of desolation. In the backyard where lived the new priest, there were red and white plastic chairs. A young boy dressed in grey uniform, wearing socks and shoes, arrived and panting and threw his school bag on a folding bed. Looking at the boy, I remembered the prayer another boy had made to the goddess when he had finally got a pair of shoes. Let me never lose them. The goddess had granted his prayer. Young boys like the son of the priest now wore shoes, but many others like the rack pickers in my neighborhood remain shoeless. So, in Para 4, the author remembers a story of a young boy whose father was a priest in a nearby temple and he would pray for a pair of shoes whenever he crossed the temple, that little boy. Okay. After 30 years, a new priest came there and his child was enjoying all the facilities and didn't require to pray for anything from God. Right. So the author was shocked and remembered the prayer of the another boy who had made to the goddess when he had finally got a prayer, pair of shoes. The author is unhappy to see many other rag pickers also who don't have shoes to wear and walk barefoot. Fine. Now, para 5. My acquaintance with the barefoot rag pickers leads me to Simapuri, a place on the periphery of Delhi, yet miles away from it metaphorically. Those who live here are squatters who came from Bangladesh back in 1971. Sahib's family is among them. Simapuri was then a wilderness. It still is, but it is no longer empty. In structures of mud with roofs of tin and tarpaulin, devoid of sewage, drainage or running water, live 10,000 rack pickers. They have lived here for more than 30 years without an identity, without permits but with ration cards that get their names on voters list and enable them to buy grain. Food is more important for survival than an identity. If at the end of the day we can feed our families and go to bed without an aching stomach, we would rather live here than in the fields that gave us no grain. Say a group of women in tattered saris when I ask them why they left their beautiful land of green fields and rivers. Wherever they find food, they pitch their tents that become transit homes. Children grow up in them, becoming partners in survival. And survival in Simapuri means rag picking. Through the years, it has acquired the proportions of a fine art. Garbage to them is gold. It is their daily bread. A roof over their heads, even if it is a leaking roof. But for a child, it is even, even more. So, in Para 5, the author goes to Simapuri with Sahib. It is a place on the outskirts of Delhi where more than 10,000 rack pickers live there who came from Bangladesh back in 1971. Without any identity, they have lived there for more than 30 years. For them, food is more important for survival than identity. And survival in Simapuri means rack picking. For them, garbage is gold and their daily bread. Fine. Now, para 6. I sometimes find a rupee, even a 10 rupee note. Sahib says, his eyes lighting up. When you can find a silver coin in a heap of garbage, you don't stop scrounging, for there is a hope of finding more. It seems that for children, garbage has a meaning different from what it means to their parents. For the children, it is wrapped in wonder. For the elders, it is a means of survival. So in Para 6, Sahib tells the author that he feels extremely overjoyed when he finds a rupee, a note or a silver coin in a heap of garbage. For children, garbage is something wrapped in wonder. But for elders, it is a means of survival. Fine. Now Para 7. One winter morning, I see Sahib standing by the fenced gate of the neighborhood club watching two young men dressed in white playing tennis. I like the game he hums, content to watch it standing behind the fence. I go inside when no one is around, he admits. 
The gatekeeper lets me use the string swing. Sahib too is wearing tennis shoes that look strange over his discolored shirt and shorts. Someone gave them to me. He says in the manner of an explanation. The fact that they are discarded shoes of some rich boy who perhaps refused to wear them because of a hole in one of them does not bother him. For one who has walked barefoot, even shoes with a hole is a dream come true. But the game he is watching so intently is out of his reach. So in para seven, the author finds Sahib watching two young men dressed in white playing tennis, and Sahib admits to author that he goes inside when no one is around. Sahib too is wearing shoes as they are given by a boy who discarded those shoes because of a hole in one of them. And for Sahib, even shoes with a hole is a dream come true. Fine. Let's see para eight. This morning, Sahib is on his way to the milk booth. In his hand is a steel canister. I now work in a tea stall down the road. He says, pointing in the distance. I am paid eight hundred rupees and all my meals. Does he like the job? I ask. His face, I see, has lost the carefree look. The steel canister seems heavier than the plastic bag he would carry so lightly. Over his shoulder, the bag was his. The canister belongs to the man who owns the tea shop. Sahib is no longer his own master. Fine. So, in para eight, one another day, the author finds Sahib on his way to the milk booth. Now, Sahib works in a tea stall where he is paid rupees eight hundred and all his meals. When author asks Sahib that does he like his job? So he finds that Sahib's carefree look on his face is lost, completely lost, because he is no longer his own master, as the canister he carries belongs to the man who owns the tea shop. Fine. Now next para, I want to drive a car. Mukesh insists on being his own master. I will be a motor mechanic. He announces. Do you know anything about cars? I ask. I will learn to drive a car. He answers. Looking straight into my eyes, his dream looks looms like a mirage, amidst the dust of streets that fills his town, Firozabad, famous for its bangles. Every other family in Firozabad is engaged in making bangles. It is the center of India's glass blowing industry, where families have spent generations working around furnaces, welding glass, making bangles for all the women in the land it seeks. Mukesh's family is one of them. Is among them. None of them know that it is illegal for children like him to work in the glass furnaces with high temperatures in dingy cells without air and light. That the law, if enforced, could get him and all those twenty thousand children out of the hot furnaces where they slog their daylight hours, often losing the brightness of their eyes. Mukesh's eyes beam as he volunteers to take me home. Which he proudly says is being rebuilt. We walk down stinking lanes choked with garbage, past homes that remain hovels with crumbling walls, wobbly doors, no windows, crowded with families of humans and animals coexisting in a primeval state. He stops at the door of one such house, bangs a wobbly iron door with his foot, and pushes it open. We enter a half-built shack. In one part of it, thatched with dead grass. Is a firewood stove over which sits a large vessel of sizzling spinach leaves. On the ground, in large aluminium platters, are more chopped vegetables. A frail young woman is cooking that evening meal for the whole family. Through eyes filled with smoke, she smiles. Mukesh, she is the wife of Mukesh's elder brother. Not much older in years, she has begun. She has begun to command respect as the bahu, the daughter-in-law of the house, already in charge of three men: her husband, Mukesh, and their father. When the old man enters, she gently withdraws behind the broken wall and brings her veil closer to her face. As custom demands, daughter-in-laws must veil their faces before male elders. In this case, the elder is an impoverished bangle maker. 
Despite long years of hard labor, first as a tailor, then a bangle maker, he has failed to renovate a house, send his two two sons to school. All he has managed to do is to teach them what he knows, the art of bangle making. Okay, so in para nine, author encounters Mukesh, who wants to drive a car. Okay, he wants to be a motor mechanic. He belongs from Firozabad, which is famous for making bangles. It is a city where families have spent generations working around furnaces, welding glass, and making bangles. Mukesh's family is also one of them, but they don't have any idea that it is illegal for children like Mukesh to work in the glass furnaces with high temperatures, which can make them lose the brightness of their eyes. Mukesh then insists the author to see his home. The place where Mukesh stays was very stinky and filled with garbage. The houses of that lane has no windows and the doors are very weak also. When author reaches Mukesh's home, he meets Mukesh's elder brother's wife who takes care of the entire family. Then author meets Mukesh's father who started his career as a tailor and then became a bangle maker. He has failed to renovate his house and can't send his two sons to school but has managed to teach them the art of making bangles. Fine. Now para 10. It is his karam, his destiny, says Mukesh's grandmother who has watched her own husband go blind with the dust from polishing the glass of bangles. Can a God-given lineage ever be broken, she implies. Born in the caste of bangle makers, they have seen nothing but bangles. In the house, in the yard, in every other house, every other yard, every street in Firozabad. Spirals of bangles, sunny, gold, paddy, green, royal, blue, pink, purple, every colour born out of the seven colours of the rainbow. Lie in mounds in unkept yards, are piled on four-wheeled handcraft handcarts, pushed by young men along the narrow lanes of the shanty town. And in dark hut mints, next to lines of flames of flickering oil lamps, sit boys and girls with their fathers and mothers, welding pieces of coloured glass into circles of bangles. Their eyes are more adjusted to the dark than to the light outside. That is why they often end up losing their eyesight before they become adults. So in Para 10, Mukate's grandmother tells that she has watched her own husband go blind with the dust from polishing the glass of bangles. They have only seen bangles as they are born in the past of bangle makers. The children of bangle makers have no other option and their eyes are adjusted to the dark than the light outside. Those children often lose their eyesight before they become adults. Right? Now, para 11. Savita, a young girl in a drab pink dress, sits alongside an elderly woman soldering pieces of glass. As her hands move mechanically like the tongs of a machine, I wonder if she knows the sanctity of the bangles she helps make. It symbolizes an Indian woman's suhag, auspiciousness in marriage. It will dawn on her suddenly one day when her head is draped with a red veil, her hands dyed red with henna and red bangles rolled onto her wrist. She will then become a bride, like the old woman beside her who became one many years ago. She still has bangles on her wrist but no light in her eyes. Ek vakt ser bhar khana bhi nahi khaya, she says in a voice drained of joy. She has not enjoyed even one full meal in her entire lifetime. That's what she has read. Her husband, an old man with a flowing beard, says, I know nothing except bangles. All I have done is making a house for the family to live in. Okay, so the cry, hearing him, one wonders if he has achieved what many have failed in their lifetime. He has a roof over his head. So the author in Para 11, the author meets Savita who is a young girl and her hands move very fast in making bangles. The author feels that the young girl doesn't know the reason of wearing bangles as it symbolizes an Indian woman's suhag and one day when she will become a bride, then the red bangles will be rolled onto her wrist. An old married woman is sitting bes beside Savita and she only demands one full, full meal in her entire lifetime. Her husband is only able to provide a roof over her head. Okay? Now, para 12. The cry of not having money to do anything except carry on the business of making bangles. Not even enough to eat rings in every home. 
the young men echo the lament of their elders little has moved with time it seems in ferozabad years of mind numbing toil have killed all the initiative and ability to dream why not organize yourselves into a cooperative i ask a group of young men who have fallen into the vicious circle of middlemen who trapped their fathers and forefathers even if we get organized we are the ones who will be hauled up by the police beaten and dragged to jail for doing something illegal they say there is no leader among them no one who could help them see things differently their fathers are as tired as they are they talk endlessly in a spiral that moves from poverty to apathy to greed and to injustice so in para 12 in the city of ferozabad young men have lost the ability to dream anything else and they are trapped in that never ending circle of bangle making despite of knowing that they cannot earn enough to have full time meal when author asked the group of young men to get themselves organized into a cooperative so they reply that even if they work together on something else the police will beat them and drag them to jail for doing something illegal there is no leader among them who could help them their whole life moves around poverty apathy greed and injustice listening to them last para this is para 13 listening to them i see two distinct worlds one of the family caught in a web of poverty by the stigma of caste in which they are born the other a vicious circle of the sahukars the middlemen the policemen the keepers of law the bureaucrats and the politicians together they have imposed the baggage on the child that he cannot put down before he is aware he accepts it as naturally as his father to do anything else would mean to dare and daring is not part of his growing up when i sense a flash of it in mukesh i am cheered i want to be a motor mechanic he repeats he will go to a garage and learn but the garage is a long way from his home i will walk he insists do you also dream of flying a plane he is suddenly silent no he says staring at the ground in a small murmur there is an embarrassment that has not yet turned into regret he is content to dream of cars that he sees hurtling down the streets of his town few airplanes fly over ferozabad So in para 13 the author sees the two different worlds one of the family who are caught in a web of poverty and the caste in which they are born and the other the circle of sahukars middlemen policemen politicians etc who have put baggage on the child that he cannot put down that they cannot put down the children cannot do anything else and if they do anything else that would mean to dare and they have never learned to dare anything but mukesh is different as he wants to be motor mechanic and he goes to garage and learn also when author asks mukesh that if he wants to fly a plane also then he is suddenly silent and denies to do that he is satisfied to the dream of cars and wants to be a motor mechanic only okay so students i have given you detailed explanation of every paragraph and still you find any difficulty or have any queries related to this chapter lost springs then you can mention that in the comment box section so you can share this video among keen learners and great 12 cbse students and don't forget to subscribe my channel that is impactful learning with nupur thank you so much